In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle them the fire of thy divine love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Ghost has instructed the hearts of thy faithful, grant us by the same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. This is the life of St. Peter of Verona, who was a Dominican inquisitor of the Glorious Inquisition. He was born in 1205, died in 1252, a martyr. Here's a summary of his life. And then some considerations on the true understanding of the Catholic Inquisition, especially in Europe and especially in Spain. St. Peter Martyr was born at Verona in 1205 of parents who belonged to the sect of the Cateri, a heresy which closely resembled that of the Albigenses, and included amongst its tenets a denial that the material world had been created by God. The child was sent to a Catholic school in spite of the remonstrances of an uncle who discovered by questioning the little boy, Peter, that he had not only learnt the Apostles' Creed, but was prepared stoutly to maintain, in the traditional sense, the article Creator of Heaven and Earth. At Bologna University, St. Peter Martyr found himself exposed to temptations of another sort amid licentious companions and soon decided to seek admission into the order of preachers, the Dominicans. Having received the habit from St. Dominic himself, the young novice entered with zeal into the practices of the religious life. He was always studying, reading, praying, serving the sick, or performing such offices as sweeping the house. Here is an, a little insert from the Roman breviary, which says this. <clears throat> Great was the splendor of virtue with which St. Saint Saint Peter Martyr shone as a religious. He so guarded body and soul from all impurity that his conscience never accused him of committing a mortal sin. He mortified his body by fasting and watching and applied his mind to the contemplation of heavenly things. He labored incessantly for the salvation of souls and was gifted with a special grace for effectively refuting heretics. He was so earnest when preaching that people used to go in crowds to hear him and many were moved to penance. <clears throat> Later on, we find him active as a preacher all over Lombardy. A heavy trial befell him when he was forbidden to teach and was banished to a, a remote priory on a false accusation of having received strangers and even women into his, his cell, his room. Once, as he knelt before the crucifix, he exclaimed, Lord, Thou knowest that I am not guilty. Why dost thou permit me to be falsely accused? The reply came, And I, Peter, what did I do to deserve my passion and death? Rebuked yet consoled, the, the friar, St. Peter, regained courage, and soon afterwards his innocence was vindicated. His preaching from that time was more successful than ever as he went from town to town rousing the careless, converting sinners and bringing back the lapsed Catholics into the fold. To the fame of his eloquence was soon added his reputation as a miracle worker. When he appeared in public, he was almost crushed to death by the crowds who flocked to hear him, some to ask his blessings others to offer the sick for him to cure, others to receive his instruction. 
About the year 1234, Pope Gregory the Ninth appointed St. Peter Inquisitor General for the Milanese territories, which would be northern Italy. So zealously and well did he accomplish his duties that his jurisdiction was extended to cover the greater parts of northern Italy. We find him at Bologna, Cremona, Ravenna, Genoa, Venice, and even in the marches of Ancona, preaching the Catholic faith, arguing with heretics, denouncing and reconciling them. Great as was the success which everywhere crowned his efforts, St. Peter was well aware that he had aroused bitter enmity, and he often prayed for the grace to die as a martyr. When preaching on Palm Sunday in 1252, he announced publicly that a conspiracy was set against him, a price having been set on his head. Let them do their worst, he added. I shall be more powerful dead than alive. <clears throat> As he was going from Como to Milan in Italy, a fortnight later, Peter was waylaid in a, in a forest near Bar Barlacina by two assassins, one of whom, named Carino, struck him on the head with a billhook, a machete, and then attacked his companion, a friar named Dominic. Grievously wounded but still conscious, St. Peter Martyr commended himself and his murderer to God in the words of St. Stephen, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Afterwards, it, it may, afterwards, while he was still alive, with a finger dipped in his own blood, he was tracing on the ground the words, Credo in Deum, I believe in God. When his assailant dispatched him with another blow, it was April the 6th, 1252, and the martyr had just completed his 46th year. His companion, Brother Dominic, survived him only a few days. Pope Innocent IV canonized St. Peter of Verona in the year after his death. His murderer, Carino, fled to Forli in Italy, where repentance overtook him. He abjured his heresy, became a Dominican lay brother, and died so holy a death that his memory was venerated. So recently as 1934, the head of St. Peter Verona's murderer, Carino, was translated from Forli to Balsamo, his birthplace near Milan, where there is veneration of him. The Collect of the Mass for St. Peter of Verona says these words, Grant we beseech the Almighty God that we may follow the faith of blessed Peter thy martyr, with befitting devotion, who for the spreading of the same faith was found worthy to win the palm of martyrdom. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with thee forever and ever. Amen. Now cons some considerations <clears throat> to refute so many of the lies, and one of the lies against the history of the Catholic Church is the attacks on the Inquisition. So this is taken from the booklet, Why Apologize for the Spanish Inquisition, by the Rever very Reverend Father Alphonsus Maria Duran. And this is part three, the Catholic Spanish Inquisition. And there are numerous points, 23 points to go through. First, the word inquisition comes from inquire, not from condemnation, because it involved inquiries into the corruptions introduced in Christian dogma and morals. Second, the Inquisition was not invented in Spain, but came into being in response to the Albigensian heresy in France in the 13th century. The Patriarch Moses was one of the first personages in history to punish doctrinal or moral abuses. On this topic, see William Thomas Walsh, Characters of the Inquisition. Third point. 
The Spanish Inquisition was Catholic because it was promulgated by the popes and closely monitored by them. The, the holy popes and the kings modified the statutes in order to continually improve it and removed and changed judges as necessary. Fourth, the Inquisition was established because innumerable letters from southern Spain, Andalusia, and especially from Seville, were sent to Rome protesting the many heresies and immoralities introduced into the Christian doctrine by false believers and converts. As we have heard some Catholics say today, why doesn't the Pope do something about priests and theologians whose teachings are contrary to the churches? Fifth point. <clears throat> the decree to establish the Inquisition was given by Pope Sixtus IV in 1478 at the request of the Bishop of Osma in Spain. The great Catholic Queen Isabella did not promulgate it, but instead wanted first to try to reason with those introducing false doctrines. For this, she asked Cardinal Mendoza to prepare a new catechism in order to give a better understanding of the faith. The anti-Catholic historian Prescott writes about Queen Isabella, saying, She never employed doubtful agents or sinister measures, but the most direct and open policy. She scorned to avail herself of advantages offered by the perfidy of others. Isabella lived only for others, was ready at all times to sacrifice herself to considerations of public duty, and far from personal resentments, showed the greatest condes condescension and kindness to those who had been sensibly injured, those who had most sensibly injured her, while her benevolent heart sought every means to mitigate the authorized severities of the law, even toward the guilty. Prescott, Volume 2, Chapter 16. Sixth point. After two years, when all efforts had failed, the queen and the king, her husband, promulgated the papal decree. Seventh. The Inquisition had jurisdiction only over those who claimed to be Christians, professing the Catholic faith. It did not have any jurisdiction over those who confessed themselves to be Jews or Muslims. Eighth point. The procedure regularly began with a month's period of grace, proclaimed by the officials whenever they came to a district where they had received many complaints. On those who confessed and repented of their own accord, a secret mild penance was imposed, but never a severe punishment and the affair was concluded without detriment to the offender. Ninth point. Anyone who was accused and did not take advantage of the period of grace was brought before the court for questioning. The accused person was asked to write a list of all his enemies. Any accusations or testimony from any person on that list was completely thrown out and could not be used against the accused. This is something not even done in modern tribunals. Tenth, the accused was allowed the assistance of trained lawyers and had the right to refuse any judge whom he suspected of prejudice. A conviction could not be obtained without the substantial agreement of at least two witnesses, but more often than not the number was much higher. False accusations were punished with severe penalties. Let me repeat that. False accusations were punished with severe penalties. Eleventh point. There was a very detailed inquiry into the veracity of the accusations. The judges and their methods were fre frequently revised and changed by the monarchs and the popes, who frequently had discussions among themselves on how justice was exercised. Twelfth. Judged by the standards of its times, the Spanish Inquisition was neither unjust in its procedures nor cruel in its punishments. The penalties, proportioned to the seriousness of the crime, 
ranged from a mild reprimand or public demonstration of penance to barring from public office. Sometimes there was banishment from the city or flogging or confiscation of goods or incarceration, which many times was merely house arrest. The ultimate and therefore most rare punishment was burning. Thirteenth point. According to the new information presented by the BBC documentary, there were more men and women executed in one day during the French Revolution than the Spanish Inquisition handed over to execution during the entire 16th century. The French Revolution guillotined 50 heads in one day. The Spanish Inquisitions handed over 40 to 50 people for execution during the whole of the 16th century. And take note, when the Spanish priests, the Inquisition, the Dominican priests, handed them over, it was handed over to the state, and it was the duty of the state to punish the criminals. Also, take note, according to Raphael Holisend, a Protestant historian, King Henry VIII in England executed 72,000 Catholics. His daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, in very few years, also in the name of a so-called Reformed Christianity, and as such, purified, caused more victims than the Spanish and Roman Inquisitions together in three centuries. From Geneva, Calvin sent messages to England to incite extermination, saying, Whoever doesn't want to kill a papist is a traitor. Fourteenth point. The, the infamous auto de fe was not at all like the execution scenes which took place in England. On the contrary, it was a public declaration of reconciliation with the Church, that is, an act of faith, auto de fe, an act of faith. Most of the sentences, as stated above, were, were mere penances, by which the vast majority of the people were absolved. Fifteenth point. The death penalty was a very common type of punishment for many crimes up until the 20th century, which, though claiming to be so enlightened in regards to the death penalty, the 20th century is the bloodiest of all centuries with its wars and persecutions. Between World War I and World War II, it is calculated that roughly 50 million people died. In Russia alone, between the great purge of Joseph Stalin, the suppression of peasants and workers rebelling against the communist revolution, people starving to death in the Ukraine, religious persecutions, etc., it is calculated that about 40 million people died. The communist revolution in China claims 80 million people died. In Cambodia, at least 2 million. In Vietnam, at least 1 million. In Spain, 1 million. Several million in Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, and other countries around Russia. Sixteenth point. The Catholic Spanish Inquisition, just in terms of the members of people executed, uh, just in terms of the numbers of people executed, the Spanish Inquisition is nothing but a kitty cat or even just a little mouse in comparison with the killing monster of communism. Nevertheless, the amazing, amazing thing is that in so much of the literature, for sure biased, it is painted as a much more lethal beast. Seventeenth point. The number of executions does not approach the witch-burning sprees which claimed 100,000 victims in Germany and 30,000 in Great Britain and so many more in New England. Many times the little local minister who condemned the people was more f fanatic than those poor women who frequently were nothing but eccentric individuals with some possible emotional problems. 
the lack of inquiry or inquisition, the lack of due judicial process, and the unreasonable mob mentality expediency led to enormous injustices, including the burning of many innocent women, whereas the Inquisition imposed restraint and peace until the case could be properly and fairly investigated. Since the witch-burning procedures were not formal tribunals, they also lacked the possibility of appeal, which is a basic human right. The Inquisition had many different levels of appeal in order to safeguard justice. Eighteenth point. It is a fact that persons accused of other crimes preferred to have their cases brought before the court of the Inquisition wherever possible or transferred to it from other tribunals. Honest modern historians say that the court of the Spanish Inquisition was the most humane and impartial one of the times. Nineteenth point. The Inquisition, looking for the purity of the Christian faith, prevented the multiplication of Christian sects or denominations that happened in Central Europe, England, and New England. This multiplication of denominations by individuals who claimed to be inspired by God dragged these countries into catastrophic civil wars with thousands and thousands of casualties. As the Protestant historian William Cobbett complains, he says, Here, then, we are, at the end of three hundred years from the day when Henry VIII began the work of the so-called Reformation. Here we are, after passing through scenes of plunder and of blood, such as the world never beheld before. Here we are with these awful questions still before us, and here we are, too, with, with forty sorts of Protestant religions, instead of the one-fold in which our forefathers lived for nine hundred years. Here we are, divided and split up into sects, each condemning all the rest to eternal flames. Cobbett, number 448. 20th point. The period when the Inquisition was most active coincides with the period of Spain's golden age, when she was the world leader, not only economically and militarily, but also in the field of education <clears throat> and literature and art. It is the same epoch which produced Spain's three most famous poets, Cervantes, Calderon, and Lope de Vega. It is also the period during which the famous Compl Complutensian Polygot Bible, which is the first printed entire Bible, Old and New Testaments, was prepared and published, finished in 1517, 15 years after its com commencement, under Cardinal Cisneros at the University of, of Alcala de Henares, near Madrid. Point 21. Not only did the Inquisition prevent the persecutions of innocent people, but also screened out a plague of false prophets and mystics, ensuring the purity of the Catholic faith and the soundness of doctrine and spirituality of such great saints as St. Teresa of Jesus and St. Ignatius of Loyola, who turned out to be the luminaries of the Church and the world. Point 22. Precisely this multiplication of false prophets and mystics in other parts of Europe produced a proliferation of denominations which were the cause of horrendous wars, not only with the Catholic Church, but with each other, bathing Europe and America with blood for two or even three hundred years. Millions of people died. None of these bloody religious wars ever happened in Catholic Spain. 23. And the last point. We should thank with all our heart the Church, the Popes, and the Spanish Inquisition for its legality, fairness, and clemency due to its Catholic thinking based on the consistent moral teaching of the Catholic Church, by which millions of souls were saved from confusion, contradiction, hatred, poverty, and death. 
the fact that 60% of the Catholic Church is in Spanish America today is in great part a fruit of the purity of faith brought about by the Spanish Inquisition. St. Peter of Verona, great Dominican inquisitor, defender of the Catholic faith, and martyr, pray for us 